The people who have walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. God has promised his people that he will bring them from the land of darkness into great light. With the coming of Christ, the kingdom of God broke into the darkness and destruction of this world. And with each passing day brings more light into the darkness. As we enter the season of Advent, we remember the coming of Jesus and we look forward to his return. We look to the day when destruction, despair, sorrow, and darkness are no more. We look for the coming light. I want to welcome you here on this first Sunday and Advent, the season in the church year when we wait and we prepare our hearts, our, our minds, our very lives for the coming of Jesus, both as a baby boy so long ago and for his promised second coming when he will return to make all things right. Advent is a season to realign our thinking, to, to move from a mindset that anticipates the struggle, that is, you know, just waiting for the next shoe to drop, the next bad thing to happen, and then start moving to a mindset that's, that's full of hope and peace and love and joy. Because God came to us, because God brought light into our dark world, we can see things differently. And we can start living differently and we can show the world that there is so much more in this life than just doom and gloom. There's a God who loves us, a, a God who saves us, a God who wants to see us thrive and live holy lives, the lives that we were created to live from the beginning. As we start our Advent journey today, we're going to light the candle on our Advent wreath. One candle for each week. Now, the meaning of these candles, you know, it varies. The words we say differ with the themes we take for Advent, but the same point is made. When we light the first candle this week, we welcome the light of Christ into our lives. And each week, as we light another candle, more light is welcomed. And when we announce to the world that the time of walking in darkness and, and in deep darkness is over, we are the people who have seen a great light. As we light the candles this season, we'll have what we call a candle lighting liturgy. In the most basic terms, liturgy speaks of the work of the people in worshiping God. So in that vein, our, our candle lighting liturgy this season is going to be a call and response. I'll read first, and then you're invited to join aloud with the bold print that will be on the screen. And then we will pray together the prayer that's on the screen. So take a deep breath. And let us welcome the light of Christ today. Lighting a candle in the darkness helps us find our way. In darkness, we lose direction. We cannot see where we've been or where we're going. A single candle flickering brightly helps us find our way. Stir up your might and come to save us. Restore us, O oh God. Let your face shine that we may be saved. Light one candle, see it glow brightly so that all may know how one candle shows the way making our darkness bright as god's day restore us O god let your face shine that we may be saved dear god on this first sunday in advent let this light shine brightly as the day gr days grow shorter so that we will be ready for your face to shine upon us at christmas in the savior's name we pray Amen. Friends, let's lift our voices in praise to God now through song. Come thou long expected Jesus born to say 
set thy people free from our fears and sins. Release us, let us find our rest in thee. Is our strength and consolation, hope of all the earth thou Desire of every nation, joy of every longing heart. Born thy people to deliver, born a child. Just King Tom by thine own eternal spirit, rule in all our hearts alone by thine all sufficient merit, raise us to thy glory. Good morning, church. My name is Stephanie Marks. I'm the head chair for Missions Outreach Committee, and I just wanted to take a minute and give a heartfelt thank you to everyone that was involved in the Thanksgiving can drive. Our goal this year was to fill the cart, and because we have such a giving church community, we were not only able to fill the cart, but we had multiple boxes that were filled with food that didn't fit into the cart. And it just was such a blessing for the community and I know Coopersville Cares really appreciated it. Now that we're heading into the Advent season, there's more opportunity to give. We've adopted a Christmas family and they've given us a list of things that they would need or would find useful or even just want. And I've put them on ornaments on the tree in the fellowship hall. And I will also make sure a list gets put online as well for those that attend with us online. And I would just love to see everything off the tree get bought for this family because that's who we are. Coopersville United Methodist Church has shown themselves to be a giving church. And I would just love to see that keep going. Have a wonderful Advent season. Good morning, I'm Carolyn Holmes and we're going to read scripture now. Today's passages come from Psalm and Jeremiah. So please get out your devices or open your Bibles. The first psalm we're going to read from is Psalm 25, verses 1 through 10. O Lord, I give my life to you. I trust in you, my God. Do not let me be disgraced, or let my enemies rejoice in my defeat. No one who trusts in you will ever be disgraced, but disgrace comes to those who try to deceive others. Show me the right path, O Lord. Point out the road for me to follow. Lead me by your truth and teach me, for you are the God who saves me. All day long I put my hope in you. Remember, O Lord, your compassion and unfailing love, which you have shown from long ages past. Do not remember the rebellious sins of my youth. Remember me in the light of your unfailing love. For you are merciful, O Lord. The Lord is good and does what is right. He shows the proper path to those who go astray. He leads the humble in doing right, teaching them his way. The Lord leads all unfailing love and faithfulness, all who keep his covenant and who, who obey his demands. <clears throat> Jeremiah 33, verses 14 through 16. The day will come, says the Lord, when I will do for Israel and Judah all the good things I have promised them. 
In those days and at that time, I will raise up a righteous descendant from King David's line. He will do what is just and right throughout the land. In that day, Judah will be saved, and Jerusalem will live in safety. And this will be its name. The Lord is our righteousness. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. So, who started their Christmas shopping already? Did you go out on Black Friday and try to wrangle with the crowds? Maybe you stayed home and you shopped from the comfort of your couch and your internet connected device. Did you go out yesterday and shop local businesses in your community to support the, your neighbors and friends around you? Do you maybe have grand plans to stake out Amazon and, and other online retailers tomorrow trying to find you know, the best Cyber Monday sales? Whatever your shopping plans, one thing is for sure. Since Thanksgiving dinner ended on Thursday, the Christmas season is now upon us. Who's gotten their decorations out already? So, some of you, I know you couldn't wait even until after Thanksgiving. Some of you haven't started yet. You know, our plan is hopefully to start this afternoon by getting things out of storage and then hopefully starting with the tree. I don't know about you, but I've been really looking forward to, to my decorations being up. You know, not necessarily the putting them up part, but that's okay. But, but having the tree decorated with all the lights and the baubles, you know, the Christmas books up on the shelf, the, the Santas and the angel knickknacks, my, my Christmas village, and, you know, especially the nativity set. And for a lot of us, I think, you know, I think the decorations this year are going to be a welcome boost to our spirits. You know, even maybe a, a help to our mental health after the past couple of years that we've been through. You know, we we need joy. We need the peace and the love. And, and especially, I think, we need the hope this that this season promises. That's what Advent is all about. You know, it's, it's declaring those promises of the coming light into our world that's just so full of darkness. I mean, it doesn't take much to look around and find it, right? The, the darkness, I mean. It, it seems to be everywhere. Yesterday morning, as I, I sat to finish this message, I, I was scrolling through Facebook and then, you know, a couple of news sites and, and it was there, you know, stories of darkness, of, of murder, more, more sickness, new, new variants that promise more danger, uh, more fear, more political corruption and egotism. I mean, even more pain and suffering all around. I mean, where's the joy when this is the world that we live in? And honestly, we don't, we don't have to look there to find the struggles either, do we? I mean, for many of us, it rests right in our own homes, in our own lives. Uh, you know, job challenges lead to financial struggles, especially this time of year when there's so much pressure to buy happiness. Many are just trying to figure out, you know, how to buy food or, or the medicines they need, let alone figure out how to juggle all the bills, hoping that there's something left over for fun. Many are dealing with illnesses, you know, some visible, many invisible, whether it's the effects of COVID on their bodies or, or cancer or even just old age. Heck, I mean, there, there's even folks who are suffering from the indomitable, the doctors have no idea what's wrong with me syndrome. You know, we have, we have families that are in crisis, children who, who can't be controlled, who are struggling with school and friendships and bullying and family and society pressures and social media, and then trying to succeed in life, maybe find love. And then, you know, there's the trying to make sense of, of a senseless world. We have marriages that are hanging on by a thread. You know, some have given up. Some wonder if they should. Some are grieving the loss of a child and, or, or of children who've never, who never were. Uh, there's there's places of bitterness and unforgiveness that have led to emotional or or even actual affairs where where some are wondering if it's even worth trying anymore to save the marriage and some are even worried for their safety and then you know let's admit the toll that that these past couple of years have had on our on our mental health which was already tenuous for too many of us to begin with depression and anxiety diagnoses have only increased as have drug addictions and alcohol abuse. 
and the heartbreaking number of people who wrestle with wondering whether the world would be better off without them. And let me just tell you right here, if, if you need to hear this, the, the world would not be better off without you. You know, how are we supposed to enjoy this season, let alone the reason for this season, when we're so encumbered by the fear of what horrible thing will come next? The debilitating anxiety of, of having to decide what to do now and, and the overwhelming dread of another day, another news cycle, yet another tragedy. In a world like this, you know, some are tempted to ask, hey, what's the point of the baby Jesus? I mean, so what? Who cares? Oh, goody. Hey, another baby born into the world, another mouth to feed, another person to cause more trouble with the potential to cause harm in a harm-filled world. And then that pastor gets up on Sunday morning and wants to talk about Jesus and salvation. I mean, really, what even is salvation? Why is salvation even something that I should worry about? Pastor, don't you realize all the things I already have to worry about in life? I mean, honestly, what does God even care about me, about my soul? You know, he think, He lets things get this bad. Why would I trust that God with something like my salvation? You know, he doesn't even seem to care about all the other stuff, all the here and now stuff. Who has time, Pastor, to worry about eternity? You know, some of you might also be thinking, hey, Pastor, you're preaching to the choir. You know, we know all about salvation. We know about the baby Jesus. In fact, hey, we love the baby Jesus. Why are you hashing our, harshing our mood this Christmas? Didn't you just tell us that we need some hope and joy and all that? Well, you know, yeah, for some of you, I am preaching to the choir. You may know all this. and Hey, that's great. We could all use a refresher. But you know what? There may just be folks right here with us today who aren't in the same place as you are with all of us. There are people who are struggling to understand why the world is the way it is and why God doesn't seem to do anything about it. There are people who, who don't see the use of Jesus, right? Especially a baby and, and all the trappings that we give him when we celebrate him at Christmas. I mean, they just don't see why it matters. And it's for them that we talk about these truths each year as much as it is for us. You know, we tell the stories of the, the little baby born in the manger to a young couple on a cool winter's night. We, we fill our homes with images and the stories and the feelings so that we can be reminded of the message so that we can live it again anew. And we can go and we can tell it to others on the mountains and in the valleys. You know, we talk to each other. We talk each year about the nativity. We, we light the candle representing the coming of the light of Christ into the world. We, we sing the songs that announce the coming of God into our lives. And we do it because the world needs to hear it all. I mean, they need to know that God not only exists, but that our God is a God who cares so much about each of us, every single one of us, that he cast aside for a time his godliness and came to us in a form like us, to live like us, to show us what it looks like to live a life like we've never imagined. God, through the prophet Jeremiah, announced to the world that there would be a day when God would fulfill his promises that he'd given to the people, to Israel and to Judah, those, promise, those people who lived in the land. And, and that promise was this. In those days at that time, I will raise up a righteous descendant from King David's line. He'll do what is just and right throughout the land. And that day, Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will live in safety. And this will be its name. Yahweh Tzidkenu. The Lord is our righteousness. Righteousness, justice, safety, what's right, saved. I mean, this is the promise of God to his people. There will come a time when the evil of the world and the injustice, the danger, the wrong, the destruction when it all be replaced with justice and safety and righteousness and salvation. You know, over the past few years, the cries for justice have rung out all over our country and all over our world. People long for justice to be seen, for, for those who do wrong to be punished and for the victims of evil to be redeemed. And yet we never really seem to be satisfied by the world's offering of justice because, well, it never seems enough. Right? Too often injustice reigns. People don't pay for their crimes. 
You know, we look to our justice system to give us justice, and yet time and again, we're left disappointed. So too many, they seek to take justice into their own hands and, and engage in unjust activities themselves. No one seems to be satisfied. And I think it's because the world, it cannot fulfill our desire for and our longing for justice, for things to be made right, for wrongs to be corrected, and for evils to be done away with. It's because, friends, nothing in this world can satisfy our desire for justice and righteousness and safety, no matter how hard we try. The courts can't give it. Politicians can't give it. The media can't. And the truth is that vigilante justice brings anything but justice. And it's because it's because all of our attempts at justice just don't quite get there. See, we have to make compromises. We have different understandings of what's required to satisfy it. We, we don't have a concept of how justice and things like mercy and forgiveness can and, and must go together. See, we continue to live in this seemingly endless cycle of wondering if it's ever going to end. Of, of meeting out punishment for one that, that ends up punishing many and spreading suffering around even more. And then we wonder, I mean, can anything ever save us from this insanity? This is where we get back to the, the baby boy in the manger lying there in, in swaddling clothes. You know, that baby, that, that young man that he grew into. I mean, somehow he was and is the answer to the insanity of our world. The Bible gives us a word for all this insanity, or, or maybe, you know, it gives us an explanation for it. And that word is sin. See, our world is, is a mess stretched in, drenched in darkness because of sin. Because we, we humans are so good at, at looking out for number one, which is us. We're, we're so focused on doing what benefits us that we lose sight of, of others. We, we do the things that help us, that make us comfortable, that bring us pleasure, that save us work, that save us money, that save us frustration or time or energy or, or compassion. Biblically speaking, sin is violating God's laws. It's, it's doing the things that God has instructed us not to do. Now, I'm not talking about rules like, you know, don't wear white after Labor Day or don't put up your Christmas decorations until the turkey is cold, though some might consider those things sins. I'm, I'm talking about things that God says we as humans shouldn't do, like stealing or cheating or lying. Uh, gossiping, committing adultery, lusting after another person, um, letting greed and pride motivate our actions or being controlled by our anger, you know, willfully harming others or murdering others. I mean, there are lists, lots of them, actually. There are plenty of parameters that God has given us to, to live our lives within, you know, rules or, or commands that help us care for each other and not harm one another. And, and there's a lot of them. I mean, in fact, Jesus summed all of them up in two commands. You know, the two greatest commands, he said. You remember what they are? He said, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And the second is just as important. You must love your neighbor as yourself. All of the law and the prophets are based on these two commandments. So that sums it up. I mean, love God and love others. Just think about how different our world would be if, if those were our guiding principles. Everything you do must, must be to show love to others. I mean, real love. Not that, that flighty hallmark love that gets pandered around, but, but real love. Love that's, that's willing to sacrifice for others. Love that says, I care for you more than myself. I'll, I'll do whatever is needed to, to bless you, to care for you, to give my life for you. Now, according to the world... That's real insanity. Living our lives not focused on our lives, but, but on God and on others. This is nonsense. But see, that's the message that the little baby Jesus came to bring. Salvation, into ju Salvation leads to injustice. Or sorry, sorry. Salvation brought into injustice and death. Hope brought into despair. Joy brought into sorrow. Peace brought into our war. See, Jesus came to bring light into the darkness of a world so focused on itself, so committed to sin that there was no way out. And, you know, we can see it at work all around us <laughs> on full display. But maybe you've seen this in your own life, too. 
you want to do the right things. You want to love God. You want to love others. But but life gets in the way. People are annoying and frustrating. And, or you know what? They're downright mean and nasty. They, they make it hard for us to love them sometimes. In fact, the easier thing to do a lot of the time is just to throw our hands up in the air, wave them like we just don't care, and, and be done with it. You know, at least that makes our lives go a little smoother. You want to love God and love people, but it just doesn't fit into your schedule. You know, life is hard. There's so much to do, too many dishes to wash, too many bills to pay, too many responsibilities, and not enough time just to rest and maybe even have fun. You want to love God and, and love people, but you just get in your own way too much. I mean, it's easier to be angry or frustrated to be motivated by what benefits you. You know, to, to look down at others or get irritated when they get in your way. It's easier to be focused on finding our true selves and living our best life now. See, we spend so much time worrying about what we have to spend our money on. We spend so much energy trying to figure out our identities and our orientations and our pronouns and our passions and what will make us happy. We spend so much of ourselves trying to find ourselves that there seems little room left for loving others. And you know, it's just really too hard to love God, especially when we sometimes wonder if it's even worth it, if God even cares. So the Apostle Paul really understood this. I mean, in Romans chapter 7, he gets to the heart of, well, the sinful human heart. He says, the trouble is with me, for I'm all too human, a slave to sin. I don't really understand myself. For I want to do what's right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate. I want to do what is right, but I can't. I want to do what is good, but I don't. I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyways. He says, I want to do the right thing, but I end up doing the wrong thing. I don't want to do what's wrong, but hey, that's what I end up doing way too often. You know, this is the human struggle. It's the struggle with sin, the struggle that no matter how hard we try, we just can't break out of our own mess. And that's why we have the baby Jesus. Because sin's too great for us to defeat. We needed more. We needed a hero, you know, one that's fast and strong and sure and larger than life. If you know what song I just referenced there, hey, put it in the comments below. I'm still singing it. <laughs> we needed God to step into this mess because we can't break free from it ourselves. And God knew it. God saw it and it broke God's heart. So he came to us. God came to save us from ourselves. And to do that, God did an amazing thing, okay? The eternal God of the universe, the God who spoke all things into existence, the God who exists in this not fully understandable Trinity relationship of Father, Son, and Spirit, God the Father committed to sending God the Son to earth by and full of the power of God the Spirit to be born as a human. To live a life just like we do with, with all the mess and all the pain. And yet to live in a way that shows us there's something better. That there's more than the endless cycle of doing what we hate and not doing what is right. See, Jesus himself, he revealed to us why he came. He said the son, son of man, which is a title that Jesus used for himself. He said the son of man came to seek and to save those who are lost. Jesus came to save. He came to save sinners like me and sinners like you. I mean, that baby in that manger was there because of our sin. And he came to save us from it. He came to show us that sin is not the only way to live. That selfishness and pride and arrogance and greed and, and lust and all of those other things. That that's not the only way we can live. That there's something better. See, he came to save us from ourselves, from the destruction that we are so prone to engage in. So how does that happen? I mean, how does a baby save anyone? Well, you know, just like the rest of us, babies grow up into kids and then kids grow up into adults. And as Jesus grew up, he lived a life that was never lived before. He followed God's commands to love God and love others passionately. He gave himself to others, for others, in service to others, and in service to God. 
he taught God's words and, and God's ways in ways that hadn't been taught before. He, he revealed the heart of God to a people that had turned their hearts away from God. See, he loved those we hated. He loved, you know, even us. He loved us so much that he painted a picture of a life without sin for us. He showed us what life was really meant to be like, you know, connected with God in relationship with others, giving and sharing and forgiving and blessing. And then he called us to believe in him, to, to believe that message that he brought and that God that he was. And he called us to surrender ourselves to him, to trust him, to, to look and desire for God's guidance, to know who God is and, and who we are in light of that reality. See, he called us to proclaim our faith in him. And the words of our passage in Psalm 25 are perfect for this. Oh, Lord, I give my life to you. I mean, well, there it is. That's salvation, giving our life to God so that God can give us life, real life. I mean, that's why we have the baby Jesus. Lord, I give my life to you. I trust in you, my God. Show me the right path, O oh Lord. Point me, out, point out the road for me to follow. Lead me by your truth and teach me, for you are the God who saves me. When we look at the baby Jesus lying in there in our nativity mangers, this is what we should see. Not a baby that warms our hearts, but a God who saves them. Who saves us. He says, all day long, I put my hope in you. Remember, O Lord, your compassion and your unfailing love, which you've shown from long ages past. Don't remember the rebellious sins of my youth, remembering in the light of your unfailing love, for you are merciful, O Lord. You know, I, I know that the world cries out for justice, but, but what if you were accused standing before the judge? Would you demand justice in that moment or would you cry out for mercy and forgiveness? See, the Bible teaches us that our sins have very real consequences and major consequences. In fact, our sins, our, our breaking of the law, our rebellion against God has one outcome, death. And, and I'm not just talking like death of our physical bodies, but, but the death of our connection with God. See, the justice for sin is death, which is separation from God for all eternity. Sin says, I want to do things my way. And, and sadly, God looks upon us with the greatest of love, with the heart of a father who's tried everything to rescue his child. And he says, if that's what you want, so be it. See, sin leads to separation from God. When you're standing before God, do you want justice or do you want mercy and forgiveness? I think most of us can say that we want God to look upon us with love and with mercy. So we say with the psalmist, the Lord is good and does what is right. He shows the proper path to those who go astray. He leads the humble in doing what is right, teaching them his ways. The Lord leads with unfailing love and faithfulness all who keep his covenant and obey his demands. See, this is the God whom we want on our side, who we want to look with compassion on us and our sins. And this is the God who came as a baby boy who lived a sinless life. This is the boy who grew into a man who taught and healed and welcomed and loved and challenged those he encountered. He is the one who carried that cross that gave his life, willingly taking the punishment of sin, dying guiltless so that he could save the guilty. See, in the midst of our destructiveness, the coming of Jesus brings salvation. I mean, just think about it. That means that you, you know, right here where you're at, no matter what you're going through, no matter how bad you've behaved or how far you've strayed, God is ready to save you. He's anxious to save you. In fact, it's what he died for. And, you know, for those who've already, who already know the message of salvation, who, who've had your sins forgiven and your life redeemed, then we need to memorize this story. We need to internalize it so that we can share it with those who do need to hear it. The baby Jesus brings salvation. The Christ child we celebrate at Christmas came to bring salvation into our destruction. He brings light into our darkness. This Advent season, each of us, we need to learn and learn again who Jesus is, why God came the way he did, and why it all matters anyway. 
See, God promises to bring salvation to his people. And those promises have been answered. As we wait for the coming of the light at Advent, we look to those promises. And, and in them, we find hope and love and joy and peace. So what's the point of the baby Jesus? I mean, who cares? The point of the baby Jesus is that God cares for you and for me and for every person walking in darkness. It matters because for us, for our world, the light has come. Let's pray. Oh Lord, we give our life to you. We trust in you, our God. And when we struggle to trust you, when we struggle to give our lives to you, Lord, help us. Help us to see you as the God who keeps his promises, the God who showers us with grace, the God who saves us. We don't claim to really understand you, Lord, or the ways that you work, we, but we know that you're good. And we know that because of your great love for us, you accomplished an amazing mystery. And you came to us. You were born of a virgin. You came into existence as a human baby. You, you lived a life like ours, and you showed us how to live a life, a holy life with you. We know this and yet we often don't live it. We often forget who you are and what you've done for us. We forget that we aren't supposed to love ourselves more than others, but that we're supposed to love God and love others. We're supposed to love them and we fall short often. Lord, forgive us, please. We repent of the sins that we're so stuck in. We, we confess that we're more interested in ourselves than we are in the life that you have for us. As a church, we confess that we too have let sin slip into our ways, in the ways we worship and we welcome. We've let our own desires, our comforts, and our own opinions get in the way of loving those you call us to serve. Lord, we want to know the baby Jesus. We want to know the Christ child. We want to know the God incarnate, God in human flesh. We want to know you and your unfailing love and compassion. And we want to share that message with those around us. We, we want to be a church that shows the world why Jesus is so important. We want to show the world how the light of Christ shines in the darkness of our world. And we want to see the light cast out all the evil, the darkness, the pain, and the suffering. Father God, we, we pray today for one another. We pray for those who are in pain. Bring your healing, Lord, in ways that nothing else can. We pray for those who are grieving. Give them comfort, Lord. We pray for the hungry, the lonely, the, the scared, and those in need. Lord, use your church to meet the needs of our neighbors. Give us creativity and courage to go out and to be Jesus to people, to welcome and clothe and heal and show compassion and share your love with them. Lord, and raise up your church to do the same thing here in Coopersville, in every home, in every community, and in every nation throughout this world. May your light cast out all darkness. And Father, hear us now as we pray the way that Jesus himself taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Go tell it on the mountain Over the hills and everywhere Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born While shepherds kept their watching O'er silent flocks by night Behold throughout the heavens There shone a holy light Go tell it on the mountain over the hills and everywhere Go tell it on the mountain That Jesus Christ is born 
The shepherds feared and trembled When low above the earth Rang out the angel chorus That hailed the Savior's birth Go tell it on the mountain Over the hills and Christ is born Down in a lowly manger The humble Christ was born And God sent us salvation That blessed Christmas morn Go tell it on the mountain over the hills and everywhere go tell it on the mountain that jesus christ is born go tell it on the mountain over the hills and everywhere go tell it on the mountain that jesus christ is Go tell it on the mountain Over the hills and everywhere Go tell it on the mountain That Jesus Christ is born As we close out our first worship service in this season of Advent, I'd like to encourage you to go to our website at coopersvilleumc.org today and do a few things. First thing is to fill out the connection card at the top of the page. Uh, this is going to let us know that you worship with us today. Give us any updates on any information that may have changed or that we don't have. And it's a great way to connect with this church. Secondly, I'd invite you to click on the Give tab at the top right side of the page. There you can give your offering for this Sunday. I mean, it's a really easy and convenient way to give your financial gifts to the church and to the work of God through this church. And as always, you can always send in your offering by mail or drop it off at the church anytime you're there. Now, this offering is something we do each and every week. But I want to take a moment to share with you three reasons why we spend so much time talking about, about money and why we create this opportunity to give back to God. Now, first, throughout the Bible, people honored God with their possessions. In the very beginning of the Bible, in the book of Genesis, we see many times, many instances of people giving offerings to God. You know, they took something of value to them and they gave it back to God as a way to thank him and to give God credit for providing all that they have in life. The second reason we give or we, we do offering is because it, it, giving changes our hearts. The mission of the church is to be disciples who seek God and serve people in order to make more disciples. Nothing puts us in that position more than loosening our grip on the stuff that's valuable to us. When we let go of stuff, including our finances, we make space for God. We trust him more and we experience closeness with him. And the third reason for our offerings each week is giving fuels the church. You know, as the church began, believers brought what they had to the church. And the church then used it to do the work of ministry. You know, these days, a lot of people might hesitate to give because they've seen how some churches have mismanaged money. We want you to know that we get it. Okay, In fact, that's why we have so many checks and balances to ensure that when you give, we'll handle it well and we'll use your gifts to further God's kingdom and do his work. Our vision as a church is big, and we need resources to accomplish it. We believe that the local church is the hope of the world. And because of that, we use this time each week to help the church accomplish a lot for his kingdom. That's why we do offering. Today, as we receive it, let's focus on that first reason to give. To honor God with everything we have. It's a way to recognize that all the good, thing, that all good things come from God. 
And like I said earlier, you can give online, you can give by mail or in person. Thank you for giving and for trusting this church with your gifts, for allowing your giving to change your heart, and for honoring God with all you are and all you have. Thank you. And just a couple of announcements for you today. Uh, please, please be praying this week for our Artificial Tris Christmas Tree Farm event that's happening this coming Saturday, December 4th at our church building in Coopersville. We're welcoming families with special needs and any family in need to come on out and have a wonderful time hunting for a perfect Christmas tree, getting decorations and, and just having a lot of fun. If you've donated to the event, thank you so much. We couldn't do it without you. And if you've signed up to volunteer, please double check your times and make sure to bring your, your best holiday cheer as we seek to help families in need make wonderful memories this year. And most of all, Pray that through this event, these families may know that they are loved by God most of all. Also, starting December 1st, we're asking our church to join together in 30 days of prayer. We've put together an all-church prayer calendar that you can find on our website. It'll be on our Facebook page each day in December as well. Our church leadership has, has already been praying through this calendar for our church, and now we'd like to invite you to join us in covering our church in prayer, seeking God's guidance and wisdom and blessings as we seek to continue serving God in our world into this next year. So please join us in praying. Thank you so much for, for joining us today for worship. Be sure to, to come back next week and for the rest of Advent as we continue looking at how the light of Christ has come into the darkness of this world. Next week, we'll, we'll see how Jesus brings hope into the midst of our despair. You know, make sure you invite someone to church next week, whether it's online or in person. Uh, like and share our worship service on social media and help us get the message out to even more people. Last week, our viewership just by sharing the services on Facebook, over doubled. So, so keep up the sharing, please. As we leave this time of worship today, I want to give you this blessing from Isaiah 35. Go from here with confidence and hope. Strengthen those who are tired and exhausted. Comfort those who are anxious and fearful. Say to them, be strong and do not fear. For God is coming. Indeed, God is already here. Brothers and sisters, amen. Go in peace today. Say